afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Welcome to our 2017-2018 uh, University Colloquium Series, We Have Ad. My name is Dr. Marilyn Wells, and I am the Provost and Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs here at Minnesota State University of Data. It's a delight to see so many students here today. Um, we have a very exciting uh, panel series for you. Uh, today's panel is the fifth out of ten that we have scheduled for this year. And our theme for today is uh, it's all about choice, comparing the merits of organic and conventional farming. Before I introduce our moderator, who in turn will introduce each of our panelists for this afternoon, I would also like to take a moment to share with you that our colloquium series is a part of our university sesquicentennial celebration, um, where we are celebrating 150 years strong as a university. When we were founded in 1868, our mission was to serve the region in which we are located the trust of the serve. Our needs at that time were to prepare teachers for the new, newly growing Minnesota territory. We were not yet a state. Today our mission remains the same. As a public university, we are to serve the students and the region around us. With ag business being the epicenter, the core of our region, it is only fitting that we take this time and as we look to our next 150 years to showcase our academics, our research, and our industry partnerships across the continuum of agriculture, food, and natural resources. Our panelists throughout the year have included experts. Today they are all experts joining us uh, from the ag business world but also faculty and students uh, that we've had on other panels. Our audiences typically embrace students, of which we see many today. We have faculty amongst us, and also we draw uh, maritime faculty as well as community leaders in the vast continuum of ag, uh, ag business. I would also like to share that today's uh, colloquium series is being live streamed, as all of them are, so when we get to the part of the panel where the audience asks questions, we ask that you please wait um, until the, uh, the microphone comes to you so that all those being live streamed uh, or listening by live stream can hear. If you are students here um, who have come, in addition to just learning for the pure joy of learning, but because you were required or getting extra credit as far as a class, I know there are some sign-up sheets as well as instructors walking around with various sheets and forms and assignments for you to fill out. So with that, uh, we have a great wealth of knowledge and experience and passion amongst our panelists. I had the opportunity of enjoying uh, some good lunch with them. And so let me, uh, without further ado, uh, get us started this afternoon. Our moderator for today is Carolyn Olson. Carolyn is a USDA certified organic farmer and a conventional farmer. She uh, serves as chair of the American Farm Bureau Organic and Direct Market, Marketing Issue Advisory Committee. She's also on, a member of the Minnesota Farm Bureau's Federation Board of Directors and serves on the Minnesota Department of Agriculture Organic Advisory Task Force. <coughs> and she's a Lyon County Farm Bureau member, amongst many, many other um, aspects of her life that we got to learn about over lunch today. Uh, again, we are thrilled to have such experts uh, with us today that will be sharing their journeys, their life stories, as well as what their current niche is in agriculture today, particularly in <coughs> organic and conventional farming. So, without further ado, Carol. Thank you so much. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here, um, and I am uh, so honored to be able to moderate uh, this panel this afternoon. So I'm hoping that you, while we are speaking, I'm hoping that you are thinking of some good questions to ask. So um, in a few minutes, you will see uh, PowerPoint presentations from each of us so that you can kind of understand what our farms look like. I know I'm one that learns really well when I see pictures accompanied with, with the dialogue. So be sure that you are thinking of good questions and I will try and run down the microphone to you when, when we get to that point. Um, so this afternoon we're going to look at the merits of organic and conventional agriculture, specifically here in Minnesota. That is 
we are all uh, farmers in Minnesota. We are all involved with Minnesota Farm Bureau. So that is going to be our main focus. Um, and I, I want you to think, you know, we're all very different. So I want you to think of it as farming and agriculture businesses. We're like a big family. Um, we have different personalities. We like different desserts. We like different pizza toppings. But yet we're all kind of, we all kind of get along as a family. <coughs> Sometimes we might not always agree on everything, but we're still a family. So we are all unique in how we approach life. We're all unique in how we approach our farming businesses. What's awesome is in the United States, we are able to provide choices that the consumers are wanting. And this representation here, this panel here, represents a wide range of those choices that you are able to find in your own grocery stores. Our panel is made up of farmers that have their own personalities. Some of us are more outgoing than others. Some of us love people. Some of us are a little bit quieter, more reserved. That is awesome, because if we were all the same, you would all be really bored. So um, we're going to go um, to our <coughs> presentations, and hopefully they will work. Um, and I will start, because I think mine is on there. So um, bear with us. I don't know her password. <laughs> so, a little technical difficulties. So, I will just start without my photos. How's that? Um, I have a husband and three daughters, and a son-in-law and a granddaughter. My husband Jonathan and I got married when we were young, um, 20, and I started farming with him the day we got home from our honeymoon. So we have three daughters, all are grown, all have graduated from colleges in South Dakota. Our oldest daughter, Anna, and her husband, and our granddaughter live in southeastern Kentucky, which is way too far away when that's your only grandchild. Um, my son-in-law is in medical school, and he has about a year left, so we're hoping that they'll come closer to home in, in another year or so. Our middle daughter is in the costuming world, so she lives in Los Angeles, California, works in Hollywood at a college. She works as a stitcher for uh, the college in their, their theater department. Our youngest daughter works as a deputy clerk of courts in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, so if any of you get in trouble in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, she will know about it, so don't speed in that town. Um, the, our girls have all graduated from college, None of them have an interest in coming home to the farm yet, but we're still crossing our fingers. Um, my husband and I, we farm 1,100 acres of certified organic row crops. That's corn, soybeans, oats, wheat, triticale, alfalfa, and uh, other grains like that. Um, we also have two um, pig barn sites that each have uh, 2,400 head of pigs at each site. We call those our manure production facilities because we use the manure to fertilize our crops. Um, along with our uh, farming operation, we do a lot of volunteer work. Um, as you heard, I am on the Minnesota Farm Bureau Board of Directors, and I have the privilege um, and honor of chairing the uh, American Farm Bureau Issue Advisory Committee on Organic and Direct Marketing. So that committee is made up of organic farmers and farmers who are direct marketers but not necessarily organic. So it's it's a, a working relationship where we learn how to bridge the gaps between the different niche marketing. Um, we, on our farm, we love to use technology. We just do not use all of the plant technology that you'll hear some others um, do use. For our organic crops, our, our corn, we use um, mechanical weed control, including a flame weeder. We uh, use mechanical weed control on our soybeans and our, our small grains and our alfalfa. We walk those with um, hose and, and walk those by hand. Um, we use GPS technology um, in our tractors. We find that that makes us more efficient. We're less fatigued at the end of the day, and we're able to use the same wheel tracks for every uh, pass that we do on our, on our cropping side. 
So it, it reduces compaction in the soils, which, which ultimately leads to healthier soils. So with that, <coughs> we're now into the computer. So I'm... Um, I might, I'll just fly through the photos so fast. Let's see if this works. Oh, there. So this is a, our granddaughter here. This was a year ago. So she's like running and around and looks a lot more grown up than here, but yeah. So this is my family. Our farm is a century farm, so my husband's great-grandfather <coughs> moved to our farm in 1913, and it has been in continuous ownership and continuous production since 1913 um, by a generation. Um, my, on the far right, that is my husband's grandfather, and my father-in-law is the little boy on the right. We lost my father-in-law two years ago, but I love this picture because it shows how family worked together from the beginning on this farm. And we still work together today. The picture on the left, that's me pulling Jonathan out of a mud hole. Um, because, you know, sometimes guys think that they can push it just a little bit closer, so then we have to come rescue him. So, um, but that's me pulling Jonathan out of a mud hole. And our youngest daughter, for her FFA, um, Project her senior year did all of our pig chores for the morning pig chores um, of the day. So she does have an interest in agriculture. I just don't think it's quite enough for her to come back home. So and this is again what I talked about the crops um, and the GPS. If you um, if you think about the GPS in your car, sometimes it's not right. You know, you might, it might tell you to turn here and there's really not a road there. Our GPS and our track just is a little more accurate, thankfully. So, but I still don't trust it to turn corners, although that technology is coming. So if you're thinking of working in the technology field, um, I, would, I would encourage you to think about the ways that you can help with farmer fatigue in that area and to make sure that our tractors don't turn where there's snow roads. Um, auto steer does have its advantages. Um, I do a lot of social media work when I'm in the tractor, so I kind of appreciate not having to look where I'm going, and it beeps before I get to the end of the row where I need to turn. And then sometimes when you get tired, you can put your feet up. So we do um, field mapping. So we have all of our soils where we've done a varus testing that tells what type of soil we have in there. So then we can match that with our planter um, technologies where we can put in a prescription in our uh, planter that tells how many seeds per acre we need to plant in each soil type. It also helps with our fertility. In organic farming, the basis is building soil health. That is the most important thing that we can do. And the mapping and the, the, the field typing, the soil typing is a key part of that. And this is kind of my motto. Um, doing what you love is freedom. Loving what you do is happiness. And I love what I do. Okay, the next one uh, will be Jared Lumen. Um, and I will let Jared introduce himself, and he has some slides as well. Hey guys, so yeah, like you said, my name is Jared Lumen. Um, while she's pulling up her slides, I'll just do a quick introduction on myself and my farm. Uh, so I farm in Goodwood, Minnesota, which most people probably have never heard of. It's about uh, an hour and a half, an hour 45 minutes away from here. Um, and I farm there with my dad, and we raise, uh, we run about 700 acres of certified organic land. Um, and of that 700 acres, about 250 of it is in organic row crops, and the crops that we raise are corn uh, and black edible beans. And uh, the, uh, um, the rest of the land of those 700 acres, uh, the 450 other acres, is, uh, um, is pasture and hay. 
Yeah, so I found it, like I said, with my dad. I graduated from the University of Minnesota about two or three years ago now, in 2015, spring of 2015, and came right home to farm, and I've been farming there ever since. Um, and so, on this conversation of, you know, discussing the merits of organic and conventional agriculture, um, just kind of addressing what exactly is organic agriculture and what does it do. She obviously gave a great highlight of it. Um, organic agriculture um, is still farming, um, but we we do it in a different way. Uh, we face the same challenges. Uh, a couple of those challenges uh, that we face that are some of the most difficult ones are fertility uh, management and weed management. Um, she did a great example, Carolyn, of talking about how uh, manure, uh, her, her manure producers, or her manure production facilities, those hog farms, are uh, how she she produces the fertilizer to produce crops on her farm. And, uh, and so um, that's an example of how organic farmers uh, look at the issues differently and address them differently. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit on, on our farm, specifically how we address these two major challenges um, on our farm. And so the first one is fertility. Um, like it was said, uh, manure is about the best uh, resource that we can use to build fertility on our land. Um, and fertility is obviously important because without the uh, nutrients in the soil, the, the plant would not be able to grow. And so how we've been able to do that is by integrating livestock. Um, and we do that two ways. First of all, we do get a lot of manure from some neighboring farms, livestock farms, from a dairy farm and a turkey farm nearby. But also on our farm specifically, we've integrated uh, cattle, beef cattle onto the farm. And that's been a, a phenomenal resource for us. Um, we've all heard the saying that a penny saved is a penny earned. And by feeding the crops and, the, and the, the stuff that we produce on our farm to our cattle, we're able to keep that fertility uh, on the farm. And so that fertility saved by not sending it away is fertility earned on our farm, as um, opposed to a, uh, uh, a crop farm, an entirely uh, crop farm is, uh, sells that product, sells the corn, sells the bean, and that fertility leaves with it and we're forced to replace it with another uh, form of fertility. And so by uh, feeding the, the crops that we produce uh, on our farm, we're able to keep that fertility on the farm, which is beneficial. Also, integration of livestock and, and using manure to build the fertility of our soil is beneficial because uh, manure not only provides um, the, uh, the, the nutrients, the you know, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium that the crop needs to grow, but it also um, is a carbon <coughs> form, building carbon in our soil. Um, Carolyn talked about how for organic farms, building soil health and building our soil is extremely important. And uh, we believe carbon is the, really the, the base of that. And carbon has a lot of added benefits to, uh, to crop farming that, uh, that we've been able to see by, by doing this. Um, additionally, integration of livestock on our farm has added an additional revenue source. Whereas if you're just selling crops, you have one source of income, and when times are low, you're a little more susceptible to those tough economy times. But by adding another uh, revenue source, we're able to uh, be a little more stable in tough times. Um, another way that we just address the issue of fertility on our farm is through the use of cover crops. Uh, cover crops, kind of like I said, uh, a penny saved is a penny earned. Um, it really is beneficial in reducing erosion. And when you lose soil to erosion, either from a big rain or spring snow melt or wind, um, you're losing that fertility with it. And so by uh, adding cover crops into our operation, we're able to uh, reduce the amount of soil and fertility we lose altogether. Um, additionally, uh, cover crops allow us to capture sunlight energy and carbon from the air and nitrogen from the air uh, more time of the year than would, uh, we would if we just planted corn and soybeans. Corn and soybeans are warm season crops, meaning they grow specifically in warm seasons, primarily May through September. Uh, cover, season, or cover crops are oftentimes cool season grasses, which grow in March and April and November and October. Um, it allows us to capture sunlight energy and carbon from the air and nitrogen from the air and put it into the soil for an extra four months out of the year. And so that's been beneficial to us. And then I talk about legume crops and how those are, are specifically plants that um, that have a unique ability to take nitrogen from the air and put it into the soil that uh, many other crops don't have. Um, the next issue that farmers have to face in the game is weed control. Uh, doesn't matter how much fertility there is in the soil, if it's competing against millions of other weeds for that same nutrient, uh, the plant isn't going to grow. And so by um, focusing on how do we address weed control, she talked about some of the technologies she uses um, a flamer is one of them, that picture on the bottom left, 
Um, it's really cool. It's essentially just uh, an LP tank on the back of a tractor that shoots flames down. It's like a flamethrower on the back of the tractor. It's, it's kind of awesome, and it's used to, uh, to attack a lot of the weeds that uh, can steal those nutrients from the, the crop. Um, we also use a cultivator, which is the one on the top right, um, that mechanically disturbs the, toil, the soil and kills weeds. And then the bottom right is one that we're experimenting with on our farm uh, now that we're really optimistic about. And what's happening there is that we plant a cover crop that we then roll down and make a flat mat of rye on the ground that uh, what it does is it smothers out the weeds and it doesn't let them get sunlight and it doesn't let them grow. It's kind of like if you've ever planted a garden and you put black tarp down over the ground to keep weeds from growing, um, with just the exception of where the plants grow. Um, that's what this is doing. And we're really excited. We've had a neighbor farm who's tried this. Um, and it allows us to uh, reduce and almost eliminate weed pressure without the use of chemicals or fertilizers or herbicides, or without the use of, of those uh, chemical herbicides. And so we're really optimistic about where it goes. And I know I'm running out of time, so I'm not going to talk too much longer here. But um, hopefully we can address a little more of them in, in questions at the end. Uh, but that's just kind of how we as organic farmers, uh, we have to think differently. We don't have the tools, all of the tools that conventional farmers um, have access to. And how we address those issues have to be a little different. So that's one. Thank you, Jerry. Um, next, we will have, I think, we'll have Chris come up next. The wonders of technology. Um, I thought my email had got my PowerPoint to where it needed to be on Tuesday already, but it just arrived now. So it's here. Um, I'm Chris Sapolsky. I am from Leroy, which is about two hours southeast of here. And I farm with my brother in a partnership called Ryland Farms. Uh, this photo is my, of my immediate family. So my husband, Troy, is uh, actually holding the cow in an unnatural position for him because he works off the farm for the county highway department. Um, everyone needs to have insurance, and that is one of the biggest challenges for farmers right now. So he works off the farm, and myself, and then our children. This picture is actually about four years old already, and so now the kids are 21, 19, and 15. Uh, we milk about 400 cows um, conventionally. And we also farm about 1,100 acres. Uh, the entire partnership, this photo includes my parents in the center, and then my brother Scott and his family to the left there. And we have, um, we started out the partnership, it was four partners, my mom and dad, Al and Carolyn Ryland, and my brother Scott and I. And we had a successful farm succession, and now the partners are just my brother and I. Um, Scott manages the crop in. He graduated from the University of Minnesota with a degree in agronomy, and my degree was in animal science with a minor in communications. When I graduated, I really didn't intend to come home and farm. Uh, I actually got a job and worked for about two years at a dairy magazine in Columbus, Ohio. And in sometime in the late 1980s, late 1900s, uh, my dad called and said he was going to be selling cows and just going to crop farming like so many farmers do when their knees or their hips give out. Uh, time to just crop farm. I had had about enough of an office job with uh, most of my time in an office, very little time getting out, but when I did get out, I was out writing, writing stories about dairy farmers and really felt like that's where I belonged. So when he said, I'm selling the cows, I said, just wait, I'll be right home. And all through high school and college, whenever I pushed my dad to adopt some new way of doing things like artificial insemination or testing the feed before you feed it so you know what you're feeding your cows, he always said, well, you come home and we'll do it your way. So that is exactly what happened. And he was very true to his words. He um, 
basically turned over the, the reins to the cows, to me, and let me make changes. Uh, so since 1988, we've grown the herd from 40 cows to 400 cows and adopted a lot of better management techniques. Um, when I came, well, I was actually just about born in the barn, that's me in the little box, <laughs> when I was a week old. And uh, that's a picture thinking I was helping milk there. Um, when I came home in 88, this was the barn we milked in, conventional stanchion kind of a barn. Um, but I knew there were better ways to do things. This was the ideal way to milk cows, was in a parlor where you don't have to bend over and, and ruin your knees and your hip. Um, you go to a, a farm meeting nowadays and, and you can see the guys who used to milk cows, they kind of limp and gimp and can't hardly walk. So our goal was eventually to have a parlor like this and then a curtain sided freestall barn, which is so much more labor efficient and better for the cows. And so eventually we built both and um, that's how we manage the farm today. This is the inside of the freestall barn. Our cows are bedded with sand and the name freestall means that they have stalls, but the cows are free to move around, eat, sleep, socialize. Um, they're not tied in their stall like the conventional system. And the sand is just really a, the ultimate bedding for cows because it's so comfortable and so forgiving. Uh, we raise 75% of the feed that we feed our cows. So this is where we're harvesting corn silage. And the nice thing about cows is that they're able to eat the entire stalk of corn where a lot of other species, humans, pigs, whatever, can only eat the kernel where the cows can digest the entire stalk. So here we're chopping up the stalks of corn and we'll put those in a pile and drive over them with tractors to squeeze the air out so that it actually causes an anaerobic fermentation of that corn silage. So you can keep it for years that way. Another crop that is very important is alfalfa. So here we're harvesting our alfalfa. In Minnesota, it's a little hard to make dry hay consistently. We just have too much humidity. So we harvest this a lot like corn silage. It's got uh, high moisture when we harvest it. We pack it, we squeeze the air out, and have a, a fermented product that'll keep for a long time. What many people don't realize is that alfalfa actually yields more protein per acre than any crop grown in the U.S. But to take advantage of that protein, you need a ruminant animal to harvest the protein. Thought I had one more slide, but I guess not. So, um, that's me. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. And now we'll have Kevin come up and uh, introduce himself and his barn. Good afternoon. My name is Kevin Dahlman, Cocado, Minnesota. I know they introduced us as a panel of experts. Uh, one of my definitions of expert is someone who lives more than 50 miles away. So I would qualify for that. I'm more than 50 miles away. Uh, my name is Kevin Dahlman. I'm a farmer. I actually happen to be a third generation farmer. My grandfather started our farm back in 1922 when him and grandma got married. Uh, my dad continued it after he came back from World War II and retired in the 80s, and now it's myself and uh, two other brothers. I start with this, why do so many city dwellers have a romanticized view of how their food is produced and a negative image of modern farming? Perhaps it's because we haven't told you differently. 
We all remember the old McDonald Adam farm or the American Gothic. That's a romanticized view of farming. And yet there are many areas, there are many, uh, many uh, agencies out there that are trying to actually beat down agriculture as, as we know it. And they've been successful in some of areas. We're here to tell you that as farmers, we love our land, we love our soil, we love our way of life, and we as farmers are delivering to you, the American people, the safest, cheapest, most abundant food source ever derived in mankind today. So we can do that. A little bit about myself, I am the middle child of nine kids. <coughs> So dad kicked the first four off the farm because he said he didn't have room for them. But at the tail end, it's myself and my three brothers. We are a seed corn and seed soybean uh, farming operation. If any of you ever buy those little packets of flowers or vegetables in the little white packets, someone had to raise the seed that was in those packets. We raised the seed the farmers plant the following year. I show this, I'm just going to show a few slides about our farming operation. This is one of our tractors. Uh, one of the obstacles and barriers that is in agriculture these days is the amount of capital, the amount of money it takes to get into farming. I can tell you that because if you look at this picture, we have invested over a half a million dollars in the two uh, equipment that is behind you. Between the tractor and the digger behind there, that's over a half a million dollars. But I want you to notice, and a little bit hard to see, there's a yellow globe on top of that tractor. That is, if you've heard a little bit before, our GPS system. It can make us extremely accurate and more efficient. That is the same type of technology that lands the airplanes at any airport and MSP. That GPS will steer that tractor to within two inches of where it's supposed to go. Here's a, an example of a field that we have mapped with the borders. So when we use that GPS and the GPS signals to the tractor that has hit that white line, it will turn it around and send it back. That has made what uh, is really nice in today's. But we are in seed corn. So anybody here ever detasseled seed corn? Oh, I got a couple hands. Okay. Uh, we have to detassel our seed corn. It's part of the birds and the bees of uh, raising seed corn, but it's a three-week project in the summer that we do. We do it mechanically. We also do it by kids, hiring kids. We've hired up to 200 kids every year to walk through the fields behind the machines and make sure that we get all the tassels. We need to harvest our corn in the fall before the first killing frost comes. We harvest it on the ear and we dry it on the ear. And then our winter's work is in our seed house, which we clean, bag, and condition the corn and get it ready for sale. So I'm going to deal a little bit or more on GMOs for today because I'm a strong supporter of GMOs. That does not mean that I'm anti-organic. These are my friends here in the panel. We live in America, we live in a country that we can successfully coexist, that I'm uh, very uh, appreciative of what they can contribute to the American agriculture. Uh, we just do things different. It doesn't make them wrong, us right, us right, them wrong. We can do that together. There are no risks that can be applied to GMOs that can't be applied to non-GMOs. Here was a slide shot from the internet. Uh, at one point, there's 4.7 million inquiries about GMO cancers. Number of cancers caused by GMOs in the last 20 years? Zero. GMO allergies? Zero. GMO poisons? Zero. GMOs have been proven safe. Defending science, people distrust big corporations. But in some people's minds, it's gotten tied up that big money influence science. There's a soul we can't trust the science. And that is not the truth. This slide is actually outdated now. There are actually roughly 2,400 scientific studies that show that GMOs are safe. The number of scientific validated studies that show that GMOs are not safe 
The answer is still zero. The number of negative health effects from people who have suffered from eating GMOs in the last 20 years, still zero. Most of you here are probably, what, 22 years uh, and younger here. The first GMOs were uh, commercialized in 1995. So any of you students here have been consuming GMOs your entire life. Whether you know it or not, you have been consuming some GMOs. Uh, we now have time on our side that says that they are safe. I like to go to Arby's and I like to eat the sweet potato curly fries. They're becoming very, very popular these days. Sweet potatoes were actually, are actually the first naturally occurring GMOs. You cannot, at the same time, uphold the scientific consensus around climate change and deny the scientific consensus of the safety of GM crops. There's probably no dispute that there is global warming out there, that the Earth is warming up. There's reasons uh, for disagreement as to why it is happening, but the science is there that it is happening. The science is there that GMOs are definitely safe. But I'm going to talk a little bit about my friend here, the European corn borer. You see that little bug that's in the middle of the corn stalk? That has been the number one pest in American agriculture corn of uh, anything in the world. Now what he does, he or she does, he comes and lands in our cornfield end of July, first part of August, and starts to burrow a hole right in the middle of the stock. What do you think is going to happen to our yield if there's a hole down the middle of it? It's almost like a tree that's rotting from the inside out. So uh, severe damage to our corn crops. Now, I say this because anybody here have a dog? You have a dog? Anybody know what happens if you feed chocolate to a dog? They will probably die. I can tell that from first-hand experience, one of our detasselers, one time fed a 90-pound black lab dog a Hershey's chocolate candy bar at noon. By, tw by 2 o'clock, the dog was dead. Dogs do not tolerate chocolate. What happens if we eat chocolate? All we do is we get fat. So we can eat chocolate, dogs can't. The BD protein is especially unique in that the Lepidopera class of bugs, those bad bugs that come and land in our cornfield, cannot tolerate it. If the corn borer takes a, a bite out of the corn leaf in 12 hours, he's feeling sick. In 24 hours, that bug is dead. So, okay, uh, at this point, uh, that's what's the beauty of GM, GMOs, is because we can target the bad guys and have no effect on the rest of us. So that's a uh, beauty of it. And I'll quickly go through here. This is what a cornfield is supposed to look like when we combine it, everything is standing up. This is what a corn field looks like when the corn borer comes in and there's no way to get rid of it. Uh, stating that uh, milk contains GMOs because cows ate a GMO diet makes as much sense as saying a cow that fed chocolate will produce chocolate milk. It just doesn't happen. So it takes about 13 years for the average GMO crop to come to market. It is the most thoroughly tested uh, technology ever in today. GMO lettuce, don't have to worry about that. There are only 10 GMO crops available in the U.S. and they are listed here. Quickly talk about GMO editing and then I'll the time. There's a new type of technology coming out of GMO editing that's probably going to replace the, the way that we're making GMOs. It's as if they go in and surgically remove the bad gene that's on a chromosome right now. Uh, they can do that in animals already. They can take the horns off the cattle. Uh, GMO editing can take the gene that's on the peanut and make it so that humans are no longer susceptible to allergies. We had at our high school this fall a 15-year-old young boy who come in contact 
with a peanut uh, cookie. He ate it on the Thursday, by the next Friday he was dead. So uh, there's ways to prevent that. Uh, I'm going to say here, farmers don't use products of GMO seeds because Monsanto makes us, and I talked earlier, uh, we live in a free country. If we don't want to use GMOs, we don't have to. There's no gun to our head saying that we have to use it. Okay, I'm a farmer, I'm proud of it, and I'll certainly entertain any questions from you afterwards. Thank you. Okay, our last panelist to introduce herself will be Wanda. Good afternoon. I'm Wanda Patchy. I am from Welcome, Minnesota, which is located in Martin County, which is about an hour south of here. That's where my farm is located. Um, we, my husband and I, we raise hogs, and we also grow corn and soybeans. Very typical Midwest farm. I'm just going to give you kind of an idea of the county that I come from because there is like hogs everywhere. So uh, literally we are the number one hog producing county in Minnesota. Uh, we're actually ranked number six nationally. We sell over two million pigs a year out of our county. So literally I can stand on my front porch and there's hog barns all around where I live. Just to give you the perspective of how productive we are as farmers, um, in, in that county, um, I calculated how many pounds of pork that we produce a year in our county and compared that to the average pork consumption per person in the United States. Can you believe that we can feed the cities of Los Angeles and Chicago together, combined, based on their average pork consumption? So that's pretty amazing for one small county in, in Minnesota. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about conventional farming because that's what, I, what we do. Um, this is my family. Uh, my husband and I, we have three grown children. Um, they are 36, 34, and 27. And they're all three located fairly close to where we, are, where we live. I have five grandchildren. Um, so they're always coming over to Grandma's house and um, we definitely welcome them on our farm. Um, just a few things about myself. I'm also a blogger, so I actually blog for Minnesota Farm Living. And my whole purpose is to try to bridge that disconnect because as a farmer, we know that you know consumers are really have become quite disconnected from where their food comes from. And so that's really my passion. That's really my objective with with my blog. I'm also on the Minnesota Pork Board. I just finished my fourth year, and I'm reelected for another two years. Um, this is our farm. Um, actually, we have three farm sites. I'll put two on here. So the upper right-hand corner um, is the place where I live, and you'll see the hog barns are the ones that are kind of closest to you, that are in that circle. Uh, we have about 2,200 hogs on our home site, um, and we also um, actually grind the feed for the hogs on our farm. It's kind of located kind of the back corner there, so we actually make the feed. So the corn that they eat is the corn that we grow right across the road. Um, soybean meal, which a uh, pig cannot eat whole soybeans, but they can eat soybean meal. Um, maybe not our specifically soybeans, but we take our soybeans to a local bean processing plant. That's where we sell them, and then we bring back the soybean meal. Because 95% plus of what a hog eats is corn and soybean meal. Um, the lower left-hand corner is um, another building site that we own, and that's our grain setup. So uh, when we harvest crops in the fall, that's where we take them, that's where the corn is dried. Um, you'll also notice our farm name is CW Pork, and uh, it is a corporation, even though it's just my husband and I, there's just two of us. I sometimes think that's kind of a, a lot of confusion for people when they see a corporate name, they think that's big A, but it can be very small because we really are small farmers. And if you know my name is Wanda, and if you know my husband's name is Chuck, you know where we got the name from. Pretty easy there. So we are a family. Uh, we can wean a finish on our farm, which means the pigs come to our farm when they're about three weeks old. They're newly weaned. They weigh about probably about 13 pounds. And then we take them from that weight all the way up to market weight, which is about 280 pounds. We can do that in less than six months. And so then we take them, and we put them on a semi-truck, and we take them to Hormel, which is in Austin, Minnesota. So where do the pigs come from when they come to our farm? Well, we are shareholders of a 5,000 um, sow farm, which is about 10 miles away. Um, so we're part owners of that. So that's where our weed pigs come from. Um, 
And we like that setup because we know where the pigs are coming from, we know what's happened to them, we know their health status, uh, makes for a lot of advantages doing it that way. So this is a, a picture of inside one of our barns. Um, it's one of my favorite pictures. Um, you can, my husband there is holding my grandson. Um, that's my daughter standing there, and that's also another granddaughter. So they're not, not from the same family. Like the, the two kids are not from that daughter that's standing there, and the two grandkids are from two different families, and it just was a candid shot, believe it or not. It looks like it was staged, but it was not. Um, so all of our hogs, of course, you saw in the first picture, we do raise them indoors. Um, pretty important when you live in Minnesota with the cold winters that we have. Um, gives us a lot of advantages um, keeping them indoors. Um, again, wean to finish, we do all in, all out. What that means is that we bring in all 2,200 at one time. We take them up to market weight and we start selling them. It takes about a month from start to finish. And then once all the pigs are gone, then we go and we pressure wash and sanitize the barns. Takes probably about 50 to 60 hours. Reason we do that is it's good management, keeps the pigs healthier by doing it that way. Uh, we work with an animal nutritionist. They are the ones that tell us what to feed the animals. Um, so we will give them antibiotics if we need to because we also work with a veterinarian. Um, and the manure, I know we talked about that earlier, uh, a very valuable asset. Um, if any of you are taking any business classes, um, manure is on my balance sheet. That's how valuable it, valuable it is. So and I'm pretty proud of that too. So, um, Just kind of curious, this is an old newspaper picture and I know most of you are way too young to remember this. Does anybody know if this is a picture of? There's got to be a couple of you. Okay, let me just tell you, um, way back, way, way back, um, and that kind of really leads into why we do the GMOs. Um, we, so weeds and pests are our biggest issues as farmers. Okay, so insects are a big issue, and I know Kevin talked about that, um, and weeds are a big issue. We, it probably, this, probably this picture was taken about the early 80s, and then the 83, 84. Um, my husband actually built this, it's called a bean bar. It was put in front of the tractor, and it just literally put four seats on there with spray nozzles. And so the spray in there is Roundup. Okay, so we had Roundup back in those days. So we would find four people to sit on those seats, and we'd go through the rows, and then every time we would see a weed, you would spot spray it, because that was a way to kill the weed. Prior to this, your only options were you could cultivate, cultivate's not 100% um, um, effective. Um, I remember being a seventh grader, our biggest job that we would do in the summers, we would go bean walking. A farmer would hire us and we would go up to the farms and we would walk the rows. So when the bean bar came out, this was like fantastic because now we didn't have to walk. But I will tell you, as a seventh grader, I remember him taking us into the local hardware store. The weeds had gotten so high and so so big that he literally bought us all like a machete type knife. And can you imagine a seventh grader giving that to try to chop the weeds down? So when we got the bean bar, we thought we were in heaven. So we did this for a while, okay? So then when the GMO technology came out, when you had Roundup Ready soybeans, no longer do we have to do this because now we can spray the entire field with Roundup and it would only kill the weeds. Okay, so that was kind of a change. Um, and just a little bit, what Kevin was talking about, the European corn board. I remember before we had the BT corn, we had corn boards, literally on a June night, riding down on the gravel roads, it'd be a sea of moths, okay? And those were the corn board moths. I mean, your, your windshield would be plastered with them. And it was a really eerie feeling because you knew exactly what they were doing. And Kevin talked about it earlier, so I don't need to talk about it. But you knew they were, you know, affecting those, um, those corn or those corn plants, which was not good for us as farmers. And the other thing I like to make point out here is, you know, we, we grow crops for a market. I mean, that's really what it comes right down to it as farmers. Why do we grow what we do, and why do we grow how or how do we grow what we do? For us, we need to grow corn for our pigs because that's what they eat. We also grow corn for the ethanol plant that's in our county, um, and so and the soybeans again is used a lot for livestock feed. So last picture here, um, I'm also um, on the farm. I, in the fall, I'm the combine operator, and we do use the technology, the GPS. Um, I can go in my bean field, I can literally set the, set the GPS on, and the way it goes, that I, I actually can combine in a very straight row, which is very good. Um, it makes me look better than what I truly am. Um, so again, I'm just gonna leave it there, and if you've got any additional questions, we'll be really ready to answer those, so thank you. Okay, so 
thank you to all of our panelists for the nice introductions and the pictures and the explanations of what you and we all do. I hope you all were thinking of questions. And um, if you do have a question for a specific panelist or all panelists in general, you can state that at the beginning of your question. And uh, I will come around with the microphone um, and um, we can get started on our questions. Um, and if you need, I do have a couple of warm up questions unless somebody's got something right away. Do we have anybody right away? Okay. So this will be a general question for everybody. What are your biggest challenges in your farming operation? And Jerry, you can start, we'll just go down the line. Sure. Um, so I kind of talked a little bit in my presentation about the two major challenges. Being organic uh, farmers, we don't have the resource and the tools that um, uh, that the conventionals have with you know synthetic chemicals and air and fertilizer and uh, herbicides and pesticides to address those issues issues. So our major challenges are weed control and uh, fertility, um, prim primarily. Um, additionally, another uh, thing that could be considered is labor. Um, our our farming practices are very labor intensive. Uh, we have to. They talk about uh, walking bean fields and stuff. Since we don't have the use of some of those tools that they have, we still do some of that. So finding labor who's able and willing to help and do that work uh, can be an or is an additional challenge. I guess our biggest challenges would be labor, price, and consumer misperceptions about agriculture. Uh, dairy farming is very labor intensive. It really is. Uh, we have 12 full-time employees on the farm, and finding people who want to work with cows is getting harder and harder, and just the labor market in general in our part of the world is extremely tight in all kinds of businesses. So that is a challenge. Um, price, milk price right now is in probably one of the lowest cycles it's been in about six or eight years. So that is a major challenge. The, we're our own worst enemies on a dairy farm. If prices are low, well, we have to milk more cows or get more milk to achieve the same income. When prices are high, well, then everybody wants to milk more cows. So um, without some sort of a supply management, consumers are the ultimate winners because we'll keep churning out cheap milk. If you haven't seen it come down in the store, don't complain to me. It's somebody else taking the profit in between. Um, the other concern is consumer misperception. As a farmer, it just gets really hard to listen to some of the um, misconceived ideas, you know, thank you internet for allowing anybody and everybody to be an expert. You know, you can tell somebody a lie in two seconds. You have to bend their ear a little longer to explain what really happens or to explain the science. Um, you know, my brother and I both went to college in science related degrees and I believe in science. You know, it's kind of a rude awakening when you um, wake up and not everybody believes in it, not everybody appreciates it. So that just gets to be um, kind of hard to listen to time and time again. Because really all farmers want to do is produce a safe, wholesome food at a fair price for everyone. That'd be very similar to what Chris just, just said. Uh, I like to sometimes call myself a control freak, to worry about the things you can control, try not to worry about the rest of the things. There's a reason I don't have any hair on my head anymore. Uh, certainly uh, commodity prices, uh, we can have some control of that, but very, very little. Uh, Mother Nature is also one. Uh, we're constantly battling a force to which we no longer have control. We too are similar on the labor where we hire help and to get, try to get quality help these days is extremely, extremely hard. Uh, so, but I'm an eternal optimist. 
farmers are, things are going to be fine. We, they're going to be okay. And we too shall work through this cycle of uh, low commodity prices. Okay, I'm not going to repeat what's been said so far, but I could, because I would say that also. Um, I'll just add to that, um, on the pig side, um, our, one of our biggest challenges is keeping them healthy. Um, I know part of it's because we probably live in a really uh, uh, pig-dense county, um, which adds to the issues, but just keeping them healthy. I just talked to my husband this morning, we just brought in some new pigs. Um, he's a little bit concerned about what's going on with them. They're just not taking off. In other words, they're just not eating. Um, he said they look depressed. And well, I said, well, what does that mean? And so he explained to me that the ears were back and it was kind of drooping down. And so he was going to have the veterinarian out today. Um, take a look at him. Um, more than likely, it will be PERS, which is one of those diseases I wish that we could eradicate because it, it costs the industry a lot of money and it's just always there. It seems like he just can't shake it. Um, and so that's what I'm going to add because I would say the exact same thing that they, that they have been saying. Okay, do we have any audience questions? Okay. We'll go to the back first, thank you. Thank you. A uh, question for the panelists. I'm, I'm Richard Davenport, president here, and as you can see, a lot of students and professors uh, in the audience tonight, and lots of people on the streaming video. Um, so for the audience that you have, um, we're interested in what can higher education do? Uh, what can we do to educate the public, or how can we help you as you continue uh, the work that you're doing on behalf of us. What do we need to do in higher education uh, that would be beneficial? Well, I'm going to say what you're doing right now by having us come and talk to you. Um, I think this is great. I'm probably not exactly the answer you're looking for, but um, we as farmers, we love to talk to people about what we do on our farm and explain why we do what we do. Um, I had the opportunity here probably a few months ago talking to a nutrition class here at the college. Um, I had my presentation all ready to go. I was all excited about it. And when I walked in the class, I said, I'm here for you. You tell me what you want to know. I'll answer your questions. And I was blown away. Um, I didn't even get halfway through the presentation uh, because all the questions that I was asked, and they were genuine, very interested, um, you, people, that, the students were very interested in what we do as farmers. We ask a lot of questions about, you know, our farming practices, about how we take care of the animals, how we house the animals. Um, I was just really, really impressed with that. I was very excited earlier here when we had a dinner with your provost and one of the deans of your colleges to find out that Mankato State is probably looking at entering into uh, majors and or opportunities in agriculture. That's exciting. We need more students out there to enter our field. Uh, the days of cow sows and plows are gone. There are huge jobs for you as students, well-paying jobs. So don't think of agriculture as the old days because there are opportunities for you all. And for you, continue the course of uh, being willing to offer and educate the next generation coming forward. To you, the kids, I say, uh, make sure that you open, or look at everything with an open mind. Don't go with preconceived ideas. Don't believe everything you read and hear for the first time. So look at, look at everything. And if you want a good paying job, there's lots of jobs for you in agriculture. I would say continue to do what you're doing here to expose students to the real world, the people on the ground doing the farming work. Um, as I said before, it's really disheartening to farmers to have to live with the constant misperceptions. They probably really stick out to me because I've just gotten so sensitive to it. But, you know, we have choices in this country on our food, and that's a wonderful thing. We have the choice of organic, but yet um, organic has sort of, in my mind, been held up as the, the perfect world, and so then everything else can only be imperfect. 
So in conventional agriculture, um, we too are being held to some of the organic standards, kind of soft organic, so in dairy for instance, even though we're conventional farmers, we've had to give up EST for instance. A great, great management tool, probably one of the most researched tools ever, it's the bovine growth hormone. Um, we can't use it anymore, we're not organic but we can't use that anymore. And we're not receiving any monetary benefit for not using it, we've just had to give it up. So we have choices in this country and that's wonderful. Let's keep them as choices because by pushing the quasi-organic standards onto the conventional agriculture, we're actually losing choices. And consumers, maybe those who can least afford their food, will ultimately pay the price because now that conventional agriculture, at least in dairy, can no longer be the least cost option anymore. Um, I'm curious uh, if you guys maybe can shout out some of your majors. What are your majors right now? Just shout some out. Marketing. Marketing. What else? Dietetics. Dietetics. Anything else? Is there? Um, you know, we've got marketing, is there business, economics, engineering, any of those? Teachers, probably. Teachers, yeah, I see a few hands up. Um, I feel like a lot of people with these degrees, and I'm not sure what all of yours are, think, you know, there's no place for me in agriculture. I didn't grow up on a farm. You know, I'm just a marketing, I'm just a, you know, I'm just an engineer, I can't do that stuff. But um, kind of what Kevin was talking about, the reality is that agriculture is so much more than just, you know, what are these uh, cows, bottles, and sows? Yeah, I mean, it's so much more than just just that stuff. Uh, we need marketing uh, marketing professionals to, to market um, seed to farmers, to market uh, food to consumers. We need um, engineers to develop the technology that allows us to do our jobs. Um, we need uh, so many different career professionals, um, and so what can the university do? It can, like they said, really, you know, helping the students realize that um, you know your your role is not the agriculture is more than just uh, you know just specifically farming, and that there's a place for just about every uh, just about every uh, career field within agriculture. Um, you know, bankers, uh, commodity marketers, uh, the, 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 the list goes on and on. And so if you're sitting here thinking, you know, this doesn't apply to me, I would challenge you to look into some of the, the careers in agriculture. Uh, the jobs, uh, they're pretty well paying. <laughs> you know, they can, they can pay as good as anything. There's, there's lots of options. You can get a lot of times choice of location because agriculture is everywhere. The benefits of agriculture are there, and so just you know, um, how can we show those to to students? And sort of challenge you to do. Okay, and I'll I'll take the liberty to add one more before we go to the next question. Uh, IT. We have a lot of software that we use in agriculture for um, our different applications, different. Uh, uh, groups out there, things for planters, things for the tractors themselves, but we need software uh, engineers that can write things that are user-friendly for farmers, because we are not IT people necessarily. And also people who are, um, who are willing to think um, outside the box, like for, for us on our farm, for weed control, we have an idea of a cultivator we want to build, but we are about two years ahead of what the current camera technologies are for what we're looking for. So we need people to be um, working on the, the electronic side, the IT side as well. That's another part of, uh, of the science of sciences of agriculture that we might not think of. So next question. Karen, can I quickly add in the IT part? In our planter tractor, we have four computers in the tractor cab itself. Uh, they're beyond me now, the young people are on them. But the guy who come out and program them for us, he worked two days, he's earning over 80 grand a year. Um, so I have a question for Jared and any of the other organic farmers, but you mentioned that um, the ways in which you do weed control, would you say that those ways are more or less cost effective than using like a chemical? Cost effective? They're a yeah. lot more labor intensive, they're a lot more work. The technologies are 
Well, I shouldn't say it. It's it's very different, um, and so we address the ways differently. But fortunately, you know, there is a premium for organic products, so it works out a little bit differently. But it's definitely a lot more labor intensive um, to control weeds, and that's probably the, where the biggest cost is um, in, in terms of weed management. Um, whereas a, a conventional farmer might have the ability to just you know spray a field once or twice with a 120 foot boom. Um, they can move, uh, the, the co-ops can move and do hundreds or thousands of acres a day. Uh, we have a 30-foot cultivator that we have to go a couple miles an hour on um, and, and do every field a couple times and it just takes a lot longer. So it's a lot more labor intensive is probably where the major cost um, and it is in that. But it is getting better. She mentioned technologies. We just, uh, this, uh, two years ago now, uh, so um, last summer was the first year using it, uh, we got a guidance system that has a camera that looks down at the rows and it can determine the difference between a weed and a and a, the row of corn and so it we can steer a tractor and drive right to left but it uh, steers the cultivator on the back and aligns with the rows of corn and so we're able to to bring our cultivator into a much a much closer gap where you can kill more weeds and we can move quite a bit faster because it kind of takes the human error out of it and so the technology is getting there to make that a little bit better too but right now labor it takes a lot more time <laughs> Uh, a little bit more work in terms of that. Good question. Other questions? So the question was, um, using the flamer, does it damage the soil? Um, it, the flamer does not, no. Um, what it will do is that it will set back the corn a few days. Um, and so when you flame it, like I said, I mean, it, it's so cool to see at night. I wish I had a good picture. I had a video once, but it's literally, we have essentially 12 flamethrowers that are throwing flame full speed down at these crops. And it sets back the corn a few days. It can, uh, um, uh, you know, slow its growth down, but uh, it kills a lot of weeds, and that's been a pretty cool tool for us. But um, in terms of uh, damaging the soil, uh, it doesn't, my knowledge. <laughs> and we've probably been flame weeding longer than what Jared has. We have a 36 burner flame weeder with a thousand gallon LP tank, so we're sized up just a tiny bit. But we, we've not noticed any difference in, in soil health, in fact, um, you know how we have the how we have the burners pointed at the base of the corn plants. We're not covering the entire soil um, surface either. So we, we are targeting where our flame goes. So that also helps to keep you know that we're we're going right in within the row and not broadcasting over the whole field. And to give you an idea too, we're moving at like five miles an hour quite fast. It's just a brief like pass it, and, and it's enough to. Uh, damage the weeds, but it's very effective. <coughs> Other questions? I have a question about the Roundup and how do you think that that's affecting the plant as far as like if it's absorbing the Roundup? Because I know it's like passed over everything, and the, I know the weed dies and the plant doesn't die. But how do you think that you know, like rain comes down and absorbs water? So okay, I'll tell you how how it works on our farm. Um, so I'm going to give you the example of us growing corn. Um, so in the spring, before we plant the corn, we actually have a herbicide that we apply to the to the soils, just to kind of prevent weeds from coming you know coming up. Then we plant the corn. When the corn is about 12 to 15 inches high, we make one pass. Okay, so uh, and that at times is Roundup. Uh, lately, we've been using some other herbicides because the whole uh, weed resistant issue that we deal with as being a farmer. And then we're done. We don't ever spray again after that. And it's another five weeks before you see the beginning of an ear of corn. So that's how it's done on our farm. Similar to what Juan just said, we have a similar type of program. The Roundup is absorbed into the plant, but the plant has the ability if it's Roundup already. And the Roundup, by the way, glyphosate, that's the chemical name for it. 
the plant has the ability to break the glyph glyphosate down where the weeds don't. So the weeds die, the corn or the soybeans remain alive. Roundup has a half-life of about six weeks. So by six weeks, the entire, uh, any of the glyphosate is already gone. So it, it does not persist in the soil, it does not carry over the soil. Uh, Roundup has been uh, very good because back in the 70s, 60s, 70s, we were using some weed killers that probably did persist in the soils. Uh, one of them is called Atrazine and it didn't maintain in the soils for too long. Uh, we no longer have to use those or that type of chemistry because we have the glyphosate now. So the use of GMOs is significant for me, and I'm talking significant pounds and tons, reduce the amount of some of the old chemistries that we had to use. That's why it's been good for the farmer and good for the environment. Other questions? I'm going to get my stents in. This is pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, can you talk a little bit about the process of a farm going from conventional to being organic and kind of what encourages farmers to make that change or um, problems with like cost and things like that when going from conventional to organic? Um, so the process specifically is that you have to farm uh, the land for three years under the sort of uh, this United States Department of Agriculture's organic uh, certification standards uh, before that you can or before you can actually sell a product um, labeled certified organic. Um, what that means is that you know we can't use herbicides, pesticides, and things. So we're we're dealing with those challenges without getting the organic premium for several years, and that can be a challenge financially for farmers. Um, it, it definitely can be a challenge. Um, but uh, some of the advantages are that afterwards, you know, there is a premium on the product and that can oftentimes help make up for it. But um, I guess, yeah, does that answer your question specifically? The, the transition is a three year transition. Yeah. And that's for crops. None of us, I guess, produce organic livestock, so I can't speak to it specifically. Yeah, and the, the rules for organic dairy are different than organic beef or organic swine. But in, in Minnesota, we have more crop acres certified organic than we do livestock, just for the simple fact that it's difficult to manage livestock in Minnesota uh, to organic standards. Other questions? Um, my question's for those of you that do organic farming. Why do you do it, um, personally? Um, I know that your question. Um, so when I was seven or so, my dad stopped uh, farming a dairy farm. We started farming with my grandpa. We had about 300 acres or so of land and uh, um, uh, two generations and hopefully eventually three generations with me. It wasn't large enough and we needed to, part of the reason was that we needed a way to uh, to add revenue or add profit to the farm to look into a different you know market in order to um, be more profitable. And so that was a big part. Um, of the decision. Um, another thing is that uh, why we why we did we started looking at you know how we address those issues that I discussed you know fertility and weed management and some of the the ways that we address those with cover crops and livestock we found were having benefits um, beyond and in, uh, in addition to just addressing those issues uh, cover crops and, and manure applications were having you know. Uh, significant benefits on improving soil uh, soil health and soil structures and reducing erosion and so we really liked what we saw when we started implementing those practices um, those practices just to uh, uh, I guess say they're not we don't have only, not only certified organic farmers do that uh, lots of farmers uh, utilize cover crops and um, all of these farmers utilize well two of the farmers utilize livestock for manure and stuff and integrate livestock into their operations and those benefits. Um, uh, so it's not just a certified organic thing, but when we started looking at how to address those issues, we saw that we, we started utilizing uh, those practices and saw the additional benefits, and, um, and, and, and that was a pretty exciting thing for us. But yeah, not everybody is doing those things too. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
I'm just going to add a little bit to that in that uh, many of the organic farmers are doing it for a business reason. They're looking at the value added. A good friend of mine, he could see that in order to make it in today's world, you would have to farm more and more and more acres. He didn't want to do that. So he chose the organic business model to be able to farm the same amount of acres that he was uh, farming differently and thereby maintain his family and his family lifestyle. So it can easily be done for business purposes also. And Jared, just to add a little bit, uh, we do use manure in our operation too. We purchase turkey and or chicken manure from uh, the local uh, uh, barns. Uh, they're looking for places to spread it and we believe in manure just as well as anybody else. So before we get to the next question, what Kevin said on why his neighbor and his friends transitioned to organic is similar to why we did. We did it first to figure out how I could stay on the farm and not have to find a job in town. But we stick with it because we found that it really fits our management style and we just really like what we're doing. Um, you know, we, we are good friends with neighbors who farm conventionally. We have no issues what our friends are doing. Um, we have a lot of similar issues on what we deal with in our, in our area, but we do it because we like it. And that's the beauty of farming in the United States is you can make those choices because you just like it. So, okay, next question. No, I'm not a student. <laughs> I am involved in agriculture and ag finance, and I would like you to share with the audience the economic conditions you're operating in today. You both and all of you have mentioned the commodity price and commodity cycles. Would you like to expand upon that just a little bit for some perspective? Probably part of the um, part of farming I hate the most um, because our prices are so volatile. You just never know from one time to the next what kind of income that you're going to be bringing in, and that's really hard to run a business that way. Um, one advantage that we have is that we've been farming for so long that a lot of our our buildings and machinery is paid for, some of our lands paid for. So that helps bring our costs down. Uh, but if you really look at it, um, there's just, right now, there's not a lot of money to be made in farming. But it's cyclical, and, and I know that. Um, I know it hurts. I'm, I remember writing actually a blog post not that long ago, a couple of years ago, it was on a group of hawks. And I had done the financial analysis on this group of hawks, which we, you know, took us six months, right, going from weed to, to market. And I did the calculation that came out, and it's like, we did not make a penny. We lost money on this group. And to think that we work six months every day, holidays, birthdays, sick, whatever, and we made absolutely no money on that group of hogs. And so, again, it's a part of farming I, I hate. But in my head, I know it's cyclical, and I know things can turn around, and there are good times in farming, too. So I just have to tell myself that. You know what Wanda said, especially on the sickle coal part, because we know that well, five, six years ago, corn was at seven dollars and beans were at fifteen dollars. Now they're at substantially less than that. There isn't probably a commodity in agriculture right now that is in the black. So the thing that's been helpful to us has been low interest rates. Uh, but as we see inflation starting to heat up, we know that interest rates are going to heat up. Anybody that has any carrying any debt at all is going to be in trouble. And I can clearly see the next year or two uh, an increase in the farm auctions as the lenders uh, decide you can no longer farm anymore, you're going to have to sell out. I think what keeps a lot of farmers going is, you know, we're for better or worse, we are eternal optimists, as Kevin said before. You know, you keep hoping that tomorrow, the next day, the next year, the next 10 years will be better. And so you always live for those better times and just knowing that it'll turn around. People have to eat. We'll, we'll still have a need for agriculture. They covered it pretty well. 
<laughs> okay, the last question that we have before we close this out. What brings you the most joy in farming? What part of farming brings you the most joy? Newborn calves, hands down. <laughs> Uh, this morning, uh, before I came here, my fiance and I went for a walk with our dog and walked among the cows and just got to, you know, on Thursday morning my job included going for a walk to check the cows with my family um, and my dog amongst cows that I, I love cows, cows are great. And so, uh, you know, I mean, just that kind of lifestyle, I, I respect everyone who does all their other work and stuff, but gosh, I love what I do and I think it's going to be the best job in the world just to be able to do that. So. Sure. I call it the circle of life. Um, anybody who's had a, a child as a little baby, you get to raise them up, take them all the way through high school, college, they get married, and eventually move on. Uh, you get to do that once in your lifetime. With my little baby corn plant, I'm probably going to get to do that 40 times in my lifetime. Watch that little corn plant grow, 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 and finally in the fall be able to harvest it. And then guess what? I get to start it all over in the next spring, and I love it. Um, I'm actually both humbled and awestruck when I think about um, our responsibility in providing food for other families, um, providing an affordable, safe food supply, and to me it just doesn't get any better than that. Awesome. Thank you so much, panelists, for all of your answers. And I think, I don't know, when I go to the grocery store, I know as an organic farmer, I might be a little bit biased towards make products. But I tell you, I, I have no qualms about purchasing anything from the grocery store. Um, and I think we all need to eat more bacon. And we need to eat more cheese and drink more milk. And we need to support all of our Minnesota farmers in any way we can. But I think, you know, as our panelists have shown, you know, we have confidence in what we grow so that you can have confidence in what you purchase at the grocery store. And whether it's organic, whether it's conventional, whether you're buying from a farmer's market, a CSA, or a chain grocery store, you can feel good that you're supporting Minnesota and American farmers. So thank you. I was going to say, please join me in thanking our panelists, but you've already uh, done that. We really are honored. Each of them, as you can tell, drove a distance to be here today. And it's wonderful to see um, so many people here learning and asking questions um, about topics that are maybe new or not so new to you, which is really the, one of the purposes of our colloquium series. I also thank you for joining me for lunch today, having an opportunity. And we hope this is the beginning of a, a much longer relationship um, to achieve our mutual goals and benefits. As I mentioned at the beginning, this was the fifth out of ten colloquia in our series for this year. Our next one is going to be um, celebrating our history and envisioning our future as a global agribusiness center. And as we look at the future, that's you out here. So we hope to have some uh, good panelists for that. Some of our other topics coming up in the series, new farms for new Americans, growing food, community, and wealth, as we look at many of the immigrant uh, communities in Minnesota, and that's oftentimes their foray into their new world, their new culture, and their new economy. Then we're going to have one on water quality in our agriculture-rich region, some of the challenges and opportunities. And then the last two are really kind of fun, and we still have some opening for panelists, so if you're here today and think, I have something to share, um, please do touch base with me. We're going to be looking at young professionals shaping the future of agriculture, and we certainly had some examples of that today. And then the final one, uh, hot topics in food, agriculture, and the environment. And some of the topics we were talking about today are the challenges with our health care in rural communities, uh, the opioid epidemic, and how it's touching rural communities, and just a wide range of topics in that. That last one's kind of a wild card with the hot topics. Um, but once again, I'd like to thank all of you for coming today. Part of the value of these is making new connections. We have some light refreshments in the back of the room if you'd like to hang around a little bit. 
talk to folks, talk to one of our panelists. Um, and if you're here from our community, I didn't have paid for parking today, or not yet paid, but um, I have some parking passes available for those of you that are joining us uh, who drove here today in our community guests. Once again, thank you so very much for, for coming today. Thank you.